All right. We made it. We're here. Um, if you notice that it, I always make the joke that I'm not Mark. Um, I have hair and I'm short. And uh, that is a pretty good indicator that I'm not him. Um, he is in uh, Decatur uh, right now. He's gonna, he's, they're going on vacation this week. But right now he is in Decatur, Illinois. Uh, at a church he used to work at, and he is preaching a sermon this morning uh, with using his testimony. He actually had something else planned, and just the Spirit laid on his heart to do something different. So we woke up early this morning and uh, decided to do something different. And if you've ever been in this position, uh, you know what that feels like. And it is, uh, it's nerve-wracking, and you're just trusting. And so we definitely want to pray for him this morning before we get started. But I, uh, I wanted to start off by, uh, by saying thank you. Uh, I want to say thank you to this church family for your support. Uh, some of you know, some of you may not know, that I had hernia surgery uh, two weeks ago. And so in that process, uh, it's been just a healing process. And you may be like, man, he's up and moving and everything. Everything should be fine. If I go down today, just pray. Um, um, I'll just keep talking, like, and I'll just lay here. Uh, and uh, so it'll be fine. Um, but I, I want to thank you for your prayers, your support, and those that made food for us. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. My wife is, is the unsung hero of the whole thing. She, she's actually downstairs teaching, um, but she is the one. She took care of the four kids. Uh, she helped me off the couch an innumerable amount of times, and uh, she was so great. But thank you to you, my church family, for doing that. I also want to say thank you. Uh, because some of you may not know, I, I don't think we ever announced it or anything. I know he's in the prayer bulletin, but my dad last November got diagnosed with uh, cancer, di uh, prostate cancer. So with that, uh, it's stage two. So it, he, it's treatable. Everything's, everything's going the way it should go. All right. So everything's good. Uh, so don't be like, what? what's going on? Um, he's safe. Um, and uh, he's doing treatments currently, but there was a uh, request for a meal train that went out not too long ago. And he, he told me yesterday, I, was, I hung out with him yesterday, and he was saying how much he appreciates the response. And it's just a testimony to your love for my father, uh, for myself, and for your church that, that you guys did that. So I want to say thank you to you guys. Um, with that, I, I also, and it kind of goes into what I'm talking about today. So what the, we're going to get into a passage that talks about time. And Peter uh, is someone who's a passionate individual. He is uh, really feeling space. If you read the Gospels, you will know that he is a, he cannonballs into the pool. I always like to use that analogy. He's not someone who walks in to see if it's cold or warm. He's not just dipping his toe. If he wants to swim, he's going to go swimming. Okay, so he's, he's all in. That's Peter. And what I love about this is he sat down in his passion itself and wrote letters to a church. Now, I, we would believe that this is the inspired word of God, as 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Uh, we believe that it is completely inspired, but the wonderful thing is he used people to pen the letters. He used personalities to pen these letters. And so what I love about this is a realization that these individuals who wrote these letters had to take the time out of their day and use the gifts God gave them to write them. And years later, we benefit from it. Isn't that awesome? It, it just, it's just, it's incredible how God uses his church. Not only Peter, but we have others as well that do that. But that's why it's a testimony to you, those that make meals and those that pray for and those that take the time out of their day to listen. You are doing the will of God, as what Peter is about to talk about. And so with that, I want to read this at 1 Peter 4. If you don't have your Bibles, we always encourage you to uh, grab one out of the pew. Um, we are going into the infallible word of God, and you are listening to a fallible man. And so you are definitely wanting to follow along in the, in the word of God. Okay, 1 Peter 4. It's on page 1016. 
He says this, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, as, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead, for this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. The end of all things is at hand, therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it for, to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. God, we, we turn this over to you. We need your help. We need your word to do it. And so, God, we ask that you would uh, bless Pastor Mark as he is preaching um, over in a Riverside Baptist Church to a congregation, that you would use him to, to reach them, and, and that, Father, you would use his time here to encourage, edify, and uh, grow your church in a way that you see fit. May it be your words, not mine, that strikes the hearts of men. And we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I had the hernia surgery. It was an interesting thing. So I, I'm laying, so I go there. We leave at 1030 in the morning. My surgery is at 1. So we leave at 1030. So that tells you all that time that you have to prep and lay there and wait. And, and so I, I go in and, you know, they, they give me the instructions. I'm laying on the, I finally get to the bed and I'm laying there and I'm looking up. I'm bored. You know, it's that hurry up to wait mentality. And so I'm just, I'm laying there and I'm, I'm bored. You actually, when you're bored, you start doing things, right? You start counting swirls on the walls or you, or you're like, man, I ought to do that when I get home that you're never going to do when you get home. And then, so I, all that's going through my brain. And so the, the one doctor comes in, the doctor that puts you to sleep, and I, always, I want to say it's an anesthesiologist, but I think that's a mouthful, so I'm going to say the guy that puts you to sleep. So he comes in, and he asks me some questions, and I answer no to a lot of them, and uh, he puts in the computer, he says, all right, and he leaves. Then another nurse comes in, and she says, she says I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions, and she, like, Puts my IV in. I was like, ouch, that hurts. She's like, I don't care. She hits it harder. And then she, she actually, I, it was cool because getting to know her, she, like, there's no offense to any young nurses in here, but I am the type of guy that whenever I go in and I'm getting treated, the older they are, I'm like, they're experienced and everything's going to go fine. Like they, you know, like I, maybe it's just me. I don't know. But I, so that's, that's my mentality. She, it's an older lady. She comes in and I say, like, how long have you been doing this? And she says, she's been a nurse for 54 years. And my wife's joke was, when she asked that, the, she goes, did you start when you were born? Like 54 years, she served, she served, um, 40 of those with, with, uh, with mercy down in Washington. So I knew I was in good hands. And so she, she, I'm, I'm listening to her story. It's a wonderful story. And then ultimately she gets done doing her thing and she leaves. And then, uh, then another, the surgeon comes in. He, he tries to calm me down by saying, we're going to cut you open. And I'm like, thanks, doc. And then he leaves. And then a different guy who's actually going to put me to sleep, that looks like he enjoys his job too much, comes in. And he, and he, goes, he goes, this is what I'm going to do. 
And so he tells me he's going to give me a little something to mellow me out. He does that for everybody. And I was like, okay, um, I don't know what that means, but all right. And so he does. He puts something in my IV, and he goes, how are you feeling? And the world starts spinning, and I was like, I'm feeling fine. <laughs> they wheel me in the back where the, where the surgery is going to take place, and I move over to the table, and I, and I lay there. Now, I want to tell you that all of this stuff happened one right after another. It did not. I, like I said, my, I was, went in, I was supposed to be there at 1130, and they started cutting me open, I guess, at like 115. So that's a lot of time to just, like, doing different things. But he sits me, I, I move over to this table, operating table, got this bright light in my eyes, and he, he goes, I'm going to put a mask on you, and you tell me if it fits or not. And so he puts a mask on me, and I go, it fits. That's the last thing I remember the rest of the day. <laughs> I don't remember a thing. I remember waking up to eating Cheez-Its. That's it. Um, and, and if my wife has a video of me doing that and I said, Jesus, it's the greatest thing ever, I don't believe that, but I guess like sleep state Jason does. Um, but in doing this that whole time, so I finally got home around four. Um, I remember bits and pieces of that day, but I remember a lot of time spent in the hospital. And I know like there, there, Time is such a precious commodity. And I think we learn that as we get older, how much more precious it really is. I remember being young and I didn't care at all. I could waste an entire day and not care. I could do the things I need to do tomorrow. And we still sometimes do that. But then there, we have a, even a phrase about time. We understand that time's a precious commodity, but we'll say, what are you doing? I'm just killing time. And it's, it's really interesting because we have this weird, it's almost like this paradox where we, time is precious, we got to kill time. And Peter here is trying to, to make us aware of something about the time we have. In fact, I did, I did some looking up and I want to give you guys perspective on time. On average, a man lives 79 years. Of that, 33 years of it is in bed either 26 sleeping or seven trying to fall asleep. 13 years of our lives are spent working. This is on average. Some of you guys are like, that's nothing. I'm like 26 years. Um, eight years of it is watching TV. Three years of it is looking at our phone. Four years of it is eating. Some of you guys are like, yeah, I'm all about that. Three years of it is vacationing. One year of it is exercising. And then I know it seems long, but it's 334 days worth of schooling that we receive on average. After factoring a few other things, on average, we have eight years of unspent time. You think about that. Eight years. And it may seem a lot, because it is. And you, if you factor in some of the things that probably don't matter on this list, we'd have more. And there's an understanding here that Peter's trying to get across. He just got, talking, got done talking about the suffering of Christ in the flesh. The suffering is real. It's going to happen. And so because of that, he's trying to get us to think differently. In fact, he's trying to make us look at time differently. He says... And whatever, in whatever, the point of this is in whatever time you have left, do it for the will of God. And so with point number one, verses one through three, we're going to look at a time directed, time directed. Verse number one says, since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. He starts this off by, by talking about therefore. A lot of theologians hate the way that they, they arrange the chapters and verses in this because they always like to connect things when it says therefore because it's an easier reference back to what he just talked about. And as he talked about the suffering of Christ, he says, since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. This idea of arming yourselves comes from the Greek word hoplizo, literally meaning to arm yourself with a weapon. It's a militaristic term. It's an idea of going to battle every day. 
It's this, it's this mentality that we do not fight a, a battle of flesh and blood, but the spirit, so you need to be ready. And how do you get ready? You arm it with thinking. And that sounds backwards, right? Sometimes we go, well, you just do better. Well, what I love about Scripture is it, and I've preached on this before, it's the idea that what you believe affects what you think, and it affects the way you behave. And so Paul, even in Romans 12, refers to this. He says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Studies show, secular studies show, that the individuals that try to do behavior modification and not thought modification, have immediate results, but they never last. But the ones that do thought modification, changing the way they think about themselves, about the world around them, about their friends, about their motives, that, does, that has lasting effects. And they reach their goal in time, but not immediately. See, what happens here is when we focus on behavioral modification, we just got to be more like Christ instead of thinking more like Christ. We turn into legalists. We start to go, you got to do more, you got to do more, you got to do more, and that is checklist Christianity. We don't ever realize that we ought to believe this. We just need to do it. Now, there are some things that we do need to do, but we need to know why we do them. I believe that. I think that's part of sanctification. It starts at the heart, affects the mind, and then it comes out in your actions. That is what Peter's trying to accomplish here. He starts this off just like this. The thought process has to change. So you arm yourselves by changing the way you think. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now, this is a very controversial verse. It's not the idea that because you, you suffer, you no longer sin ever again. We have flesh, we're still in the flesh, and we will struggle with this. The idea here is that we suffer with Christ and his love covers our sin. It's his grace, it's his actions, it's his suffering that covers our sins. And so now we are free from sin. It is now when I do sin, I sin by choice, not inevitably. Before salvation, your good works are as filthy rags to God. Now that you have believed in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, taking the penalty of your sin, now you no longer have to sin. The things you now do, you are free to do them in the will of God, how he intended you to do them. It's a really freeing aspect and prospect that we ought to look at. But whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. He goes on to this. Why? So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for what? The will of God. So we change the way our thinking, why? So we can live the rest of our lives to the will of God. It is no longer about me. Nothing is, nothing. And it's a really interesting thing because he actually goes on to say this. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. He's, he's going, so the time you have left, you don't need to go back here because here's what they focus on. And he's saying this, he's writing to a Jewish people. And, he's, and so that's why he uses this idea of Gentiles. He's the Gentiles that are still in their sin. He's pointing to them as an example. He's not saying all Gentiles are doing this. He's saying specifically the Gentiles that you're watching are doing this. And he's... He starts by listing a whole list of sins. Now these, before we get into these, the list of sins, I want to kind of set up a pretext here. At this time, the Gentiles were worshiping idols. Idols that in their required worship that these men decided to think up, they needed uninhibited passion in order to worship them. Now, what's really interesting is this mindset is not about an idol, but it is really about self. They want to dive into their lusts and their passions for themselves, and then they glorify it by saying it's for an idol. Sound familiar? We all do it. 
We all do this. We all will do something and we'll try to glorify it by saying it's for something else when really it's for me. It's a really good opportunity for us to gut check ourselves on the motives in which we do things. Because if we are listening to Peter here and he's saying for the time you have left, don't do, don't go back to what you used to do. Don't go to what the Gentiles are doing what the flesh is trying to direct you to do. Do it for the will of God. That's the point. So I want to look at these because I think what's really really easy for us to do is when we read passages like this, we can look at these non-exhaustive lists of sins and we can go, man, mine's not on there, so I'm okay. Or we don't really define one of the terms that could be against us and we're like, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I'm not, I'm not lost in one of these, so it's okay. So I wanted to find them. You're welcome. All right. When he talks about these things, he starts off with two, two specific things. And it's really easy to overlook them. And I want, I believe that these first two hit everybody here, including myself. I'll tell you why, because I think God is really working on me specifically on this issue. Now I'll explain why. The first two that are mentioned here, sensuality and passions. Sensuality describes those who engage in unbridled, unrestrained vices of all sorts. Passions, sinful passions that drive people into such indulgence. Now, you could be like, well, I'm not completely uninhibitedly like going into this thing, but I'm I want to make people aware of something. In our Western culture, in our, we do a lot of this thing called self-care. Me time. I need to get away. And so what we do is we spend uninhibited time in our hobbies, in our desires, or whatever that looks like. We, we have this element of this is for me, and so that's why I'm going to. I had a hard week. I just need a little me time. And even if you are someone that pours into people all week, have you ever heard the phrase, like, you can't pour into someone with an empty vessel? Like, it's this mindset that people oftentimes fool themselves into having because they say, they say you have to do this for yourself because you got to be healthy in order for you to healthily pour into someone else. And I want to go, let's pump the brakes. Because what I read from the Bible is not that. What I read from the Bible is Jesus gives us overflowing abundant life. Like, my question would be, what are you relying on in this time that you have left that you feel fills up your vessel to pour into someone else? Is it Christ? Because Christ is the one that gives it. In fact, when the Bible talks about in that time that you feel empty, you know what he says to Paul? He goes, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made great in your weakness. Where you're weak, he is strong. So in your weakest moment, when you feel empty, when you're really not, if you're trusting in the Lord, when you feel empty, that's when God's acting the greatest in in your life. And we don't realize that because we hear from the TV and we hear from YouTube and we hear from all these things, all the other things that are going to fulfill us to use the time we have left for his glory. As long as I get my me time, I'll be fine. This is uninhibited mindset into this self-care system that, sh- that doesn't exist. It doesn't exist in the kingdom of God. It, in its very name, it's blaspheming to Jesus. Self-care. It's about me. And I think it's really interesting because, and you may be like, why are you so hard on this? Because God's doing that to me right now. I, I'm amazed when I had this surgery that I had to sit and think about things. 
and all the things that God was taking away from me because I couldn't do them. And I wanted to do them, not because I wanted to do them for the will of God, but because I wanted comfort. I wanted, I wanted me time. I wanted things for Jason. And God's going, no. There's a way to do those things, but they're not for you. And so when we look at this, I think it's really convicting in the Western theology that we have how much we spend time for ourselves. In fact, we go so far as to do this. We will look at our time and we'll go, as long as I do these things, God will let me have these things. As long as I'm in church, I'm praying, I read my Bible, I made a meal for Jesus. Not, I'm not dogging anybody, I made a meal for me. It was delicious, you can keep them coming. Um, but all of these things, I'll check off all of these things so that God will allow me, because I've earned my time, to let me have all of this stuff. That's not in Scripture. He wants it all. Because when we get to that point, now we're being checklist Christians, which isn't the will of God. It's a hard truth to realize because it, it hits you where it hurts. Because when you start thinking about the time you're spending, even because people will rationalize, well, what about the Sabbath? The Sabbath was meant to re revitalize by looking back at the Lord and what he's done. Even the Sabbath was to his glory, not for me. So day of rest in who? In him. It's, it's eye-opening. At least it has been for me. So sensuality and passions should strike every single one of us. And by the way, I don't think this is something that we will get past until we die. <laughs> But I think it's something we strive for, to live the rest of our lives and the time we have left for the will of God. He goes on and he says these things. He says, drunkenness. This is an idea of sinful or refers to habitual intoxication or narcotic use. These individuals in this day would use these to escape. Escape life, escape um, that would help them become this uninhibited self to do the things that they wanted to do. It would take away all morals and all filters, and they could do things uninhibitedly for their idol. The next thing, orgies, drunken parties, and lawless idolatry. They would have week to month long parties for this idol forsaking all responsibility, forsaking all matters of importance for themselves and for an idol and for their lustful passions. He goes on to point number two. Time judged. As he refers, he refers back to the Gentiles when he says this in verse 4 and 5. He says, with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, or debauchery, and they malign you, but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. This is a really interesting thing because in our day and age, we see this more and more in the church. When we choose to live our lives in the time we have left for the will of God, people don't get it. This idea of radical abandonment of self. In fact, they go so far as when you make decisions for the Lord, those that don't understand look at you and go, I don't understand you. When I lived in Michigan... Um, I may have told you this story. When I lived in Michigan, I, I had, there was some things going on in the church and just, and this was like year after, right before year two. 
And we come, we come back home, and I'm visiting friends, and I'm having lunch with friends, and just I have, my family was having a hard time up there. And I remember talking to a friend of mine who isn't saved and sitting across from him, and, and he goes, he's, he said, he's an old, old friend of mine. We share a lot together, and, and, and it's really cool how God orchestrates friendships like that. But he, he says, then why are you up there? If you're having such a hard time, why are you up there? Why, like, don't, he literally said, don't you, like, want, think about your own happiness, your wife's happiness? Like, is that even a blip on the radar? Because he, he, he asked me the question, are you happy up there? And I thought about it. And I wasn't. At that time, I wasn't. And I, and I think about this because of when I said, I, you know, I, I sat there in silence and I, and I was like, it's a good question. And I go, the reason why I'm up there is not for me. The reason I'm up there, and I, I don't want to like toot my own horn because I mess up plenty. But the idea, like I said, the reason why I'm up there is for those people. I had a heart for those people, for those teens that I was serving for and my wife did too. And we were willing to live in an unhappy state in order to pour into these individuals who need Jesus and need discipling. And he said to me, he goes, that just sounds so foreign to me. To people that don't live for the will of God, living for the will of God's foreign. It doesn't make sense. And in this, he, they... Peter goes so far as to address the fact that these individuals, these Gentiles, are mocking and going after these Christians. He's, it, and nowadays, we, we would look at it like when we think of things that God's called us to do, and we do them because we love Christ, not because they're checklists. We do them because we love Christ. When someone says, hey, are you going to, can you come out on Sunday morning and do this? You go, no, because I have to be at church. I want to go to church. Do not forsake the gathering of believers. That is not a suggestion. It's a command by God to be here. I don't get it. You'd rather do that and listen to this guy than go out and do this. When we start living our lives for how God designed us to live as moms and dads, where we go, we are... We are prioritizing our lives around discipling our children. I can't believe you'd do it that way. What idiot would do it like that? I, I, why, why would you say that? I do it because Deuteronomy 6, God tells me to bring up my children in this way. Love the Lord your God with everything you have and impress these things on your children. I do it because God tells me to, and I want to do it because God tells me to. I love him. It's radical abandonment of self when people start asking you why you do things the way you do them for the Lord, and you answer them, and they look at you kind of cross-eyed, and they're like, I don't, I don't understand. And it goes even further to people losing their jobs because they stand up for the Lord because they didn't sign something. You're going to lose your job if you don't do this. And you have to make a decision. you got your family. You have your thoughts, all these things. And you are about to get judged for what you believe. There are, there are cities in this nation that turn away individuals if they claim Christianity. Here's what he says. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. They will be held accountable for what they do. Now at this time, there was the punishments that we receive relatively are great. But they were receiving death, martyrdom. Like really, really bad stuff was happening to their families because of what they believed. And God, God says, vengeance is mine. And there's so many times where we, we hear we lose friends over this stuff. 
We get burned because of this stuff. And God, God and Peter's trying to go, it's worth it. Trust me, it's worth it. Let me deal with those individuals. In verse 6, he says, For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. It's for these people that the gospel is shared. Not only that, but this, he's also answering a question. There was a lot of individuals that were like, well, what about the dead people? I know we're sharing the gospel for those that are alive, but what about those that have been dead? And he answers this. He, he answers the confusion within the people of what happened to the dead, even those before Christ, that they will be given life for those that accepted the gospel, had faith in God that it was accounted to them as righteousness. What, this, what these verses show us is that there's a horizontal judgment and a vertical judgment, and one matters more than the other. And so in the time that we have left, we live for that, the one that matters more than the other. Point number three, time utilized. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. We see a, a phrase according to time again. He's looking at this. He's creating an urgency in, in these individuals. The end of all things is at hand. Theologians believe that this could be one of three things, but most of them land on this one. They, they believe that it's either the second coming of Christ the end of temple worship, which at that time, at 70 AD, the last temple was destroyed um, for the Jewish people. And then the other one was the demise, specifically for those that the letter was written to. But in, in all of the evidence behind the scripture, they would see it as the second coming of Christ and the meaning of Peter's letter. The thing, the thing that he's trying to create here is you have limited time. Even Moses in Psalm 90 says, says this, count your, or number your days. Number your days. The, it's the mindset that we ought to be aware, not that we would be anxious or nervous or fearful, but that we would be wise in our days that we have left. The end of all things is at hand. So... Therefore, do this. He says, be self-controlled and sober-minded. He addresses two different things here. He addresses action and thoughts. See how it comes up again? So at the very beginning, arm yourself the way you think, and now he's addressing the way we act. And so now it's sober-mindedness and self-controlled. This idea of sober-mindedness and self-controlled is this idea that we would be aware not, not clouded, fog of warish, but that we would be aware of spiritual things going on so that we would have a heart of prayer. For the sake of your prayers. In fact, when it comes to time, sources say that ad, the average Christian prays 45 seconds a day. That should be humbling and put you where you need to be. <laughs> I know it is for me. They say that the 45 seconds is often done before, before eating. And I would venture to say that a 45-second prayer before eating is too long. No, I'm kidding. You know some people like to give sermons before we eat, and I'm not a fan of that. I'm like, let me eat the chicken. <laughs> but you think about this. 45 seconds a day. Now, I'm a guy who loves the shotgun prayer. I'm a Nehemiah 2 guy, all right? So I'm like, I'm going into a situation. I'm like, Lord, help me. When I walk out, I go, thank you, Lord, that you helped me. I do that a ton. But to, but to this idea of sober-mindedness and self-control to the point where I desire to sit down and meditate and pray to the living God who created everything that can be hard to do. Which is why he tells us to change the way we think. Because so often we look at our time and we go, that's, 
I don't have time to just sit down and pray. Have you ever tried it? You just resign to say you don't have the time. I can tell you this. When you've decided, and some of you guys can attest to this, when you've sat, sat down and decided to pray about stuff, you actually look at the time when you're done and you're like, whoa, I had a lot to get off my chest for Jesus. Like, thank the Lord he listens to us. And he wants to listen. So in the time you have left, maybe you ought to spend less time doing this and more time in prayer. I know that pastors and everybody else say this line, that if, if, if a church would spend more time praying, imagine the effect that it would have on a, on a community. I'll, I'll say this as a testimony. At our church, we do value prayer. We pray before everything. We turn everything over to God. In fact, if you have ever had a conversation with Pastor Mark, he will say, can we pray? Can we pray first? Let's pray first. Or like when something happens, he'll go, can we pray for that? It's, it's really cool. Uh, one of my favorite prayer warriors in this room are both Ed Pauley and, and Moses Estevez. They, they love to pray. I think it's incredible. But when we were, when, whenever we first came here, and this would have been almost seven years ago, I remember the nursery workers deciding to pray that there would be, a, that nursery would fill up with babies. They didn't do anything different. They prayed. That's it. They prayed. Families started coming. People started having babies. And we had to knock down a wall down there to make more room for the amount of children that were in that room. They were stressing that we didn't have enough workers for a time, which is a great problem to have. Why? Not because we're great, but because God is, and we got him involved. Over there in the youth building, I'm sure I've told this story before. When we came over here on a Sunday morning, the first Sunday I was here, I walked in there, and there were three students in that room, three. And I sat down, we talked Star Wars almost the entire time, the most holy conversations you can have. And I remember having these conversations, just hanging out, and I'm like, this is a good starting point. And we went for about two years, and it was just like we just didn't see that growth. And one day, the, the, again, this is the youth leaders, they decided to pray. So we spent the Sunday, 30 minutes before we had youth group, we would get together and we would pray for our youth group. And it got so, so popular that the students were like, what are you doing? And they started coming and praying for their youth group. And we went from like 10 to 17, to 27, to now like 35 to 40. Sometimes we have 52, 53 people over there. I didn't do anything different. I don't do anything. I do the same thing every time. They probably hate it, but they come because they know God loves them. And they love coming because they love God. And God's the reason that this happened, not because of me, but because of him. When I read books on ministry, if I don't see anything in that book about prayer, I usually toss it. It's not worth anything because ministry is oftentimes not formulaic. It's whether or not God is involved in it, which is why we have to be sober-minded. It's got to be getting him involved. He keeps going, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. This is, this is an agape type of love. And this, this phrase, love covers a multitude of sins, this is an idea that agape, selfless, self-sacrificing love does not focus on sin. It focuses on caring. It's a compassionate love, not a condemning one. He quotes this from Proverbs 10, 12. Proverbs 10, 12. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. It's a beautiful verse, one that I think that we could all utilize, that in the time we have left, we love one another intentionally, earnestly, with passion. Verse number nine, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. If this doesn't affect everyone in here, I don't know what will. I can tell you, seeking to show hospitality to someone is easy until they overstay their welcome. 
Yeah, I've, I'm telling you, this is, this is a normal thing. And, it, and I've shared this before, but the idea that everything's fine when we're a servant, but when we become a slave, we're a little offended. When we're expected to do something, when everything, when gratitude starts going out the window, and we're like, people stop asking and start telling, we're like, oh, we're out, and we're done with this. One, one uh, commentary put, there are people who exploit the hospitality and kindness of those who practice it. Amen? And then he says, but that does not matter. The goal here is to show love to one another, specifically to brothers and sisters in Christ, without grumbling. The Jewish nation in and of themselves were semi-nomadic. All the, all the time they had missionaries coming through. And you, if you know yourself... If you're a type A personality, you have a tough time spending a long time with type Bs and vice versa. It's just the truth. But the, but, the, but the real truth here is God requires us to do it without grumbling and loving one another earnestly. We change the way we think to do this for one another. Verse 10 and 11. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. I want to share a story with this, but I want to look at real quick. Whoever speaks is who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. These two things go on to the next part of the verse in verse 11b, which is time redeemed. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. All of these things that we do, we do for the will of God. Why? Because he deserves the glory and it's his dominion whether you like it or not. Forever and ever. We don't have a choice. You're either on the right side of that equation or on the wrong side, and I don't want to be on the wrong side. In the time you have left, are you doing it for the glory of God and his dominion, or are you doing it for yourself? This idea of of we've received a gift and we ought to use our gifts. I know Pastor Mark preaches on this a ton. I do too, because I'm really big on serving the Lord the way he's called us to serve him and to use our gifts to edify the church and to give him glory. I want to share a story with you, and I'll end with this. Um, When my mom was alive, so we grew up going to a church, and in that process of going to the church, my mom and dad were heavily involved, and they loved serving. Uh, They they did. I remember countless times where I would be in my house. We uh, we would go to church uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night. We'd have a Bible study at my house on Tuesday. Wednesday night, we would be at the church. We, would, we were doing stuff or serving the church in some way all the time. The time that my parents put into it was really cool. And I remember seeing all of that. In fact, a lot of the, in, in, most of the time, anything that I'm mimicking is usually because they've done it. They did it and mim- showed me how, and I do it, and they did They did such a good job of discipling me and my siblings. Well, some of you guys may know, and some of you guys may have experienced this before, but you pour heart and soul into a church, and then ultimately stuff happens within that church. Bad things can happen. People get divided. Pettiness ensues, and ultimately you get burned. And that's what happened to my family. Now, my family's not perfect. They didn't come out as they, as they had the crown on their head. They, they weren't, they had their own things. But ultimately, we left that church. We went to a different church. But my mom never went back. And my, my dad went, me and my siblings went, but I, my mom was burned. And I think she loved, I, she loved the Lord. I believe she saved, and I believe that Uh, God did a work in her heart because years later she she had that door closed and then all of a sudden uh, one day she started to open that door to coming to grace and I'm in Michigan at this time my dad she she I would talk to her every now and then like every couple of days or three days and she calls me she says hey I've been going to church with your dad at grace and I was like that's incredible praise the Lord why 
What changed? Like, I always like to know that stuff. It's not like, because I, I, I believe what you think changes how you behave. So it's not behavior modification. There was something, thought process that changed it. Because it wasn't like she was dragging her feet to go to church. She wanted to go to church. And I said, that's great. And she said, well, I've been talking to some people. And they've just been really inviting. And I was like, that's awesome. So then, a few months go by, and she calls me. I remember it was uh, in the winter, and she calls me, and she said, you know what? I'm going to serve in the children's ministry. She was so excited. How cool. I'm like, what happened? I mean, she, she didn't want to open the door, and now she's kicking it down. She's ready to go. And here's what happened. She called me, and, and I'm asking her, I was like, so what's this big change? What's going on in your life? And she said, there are, I've been talking to some people, and I said, really? Like, what, what's going on in those conversations? She said, well, they're listening to me. They're, they understand my hurt. They know what I went through. And they've just been so encouraging and loving. I'm amazed. And I'll tell you who it was. Because even that day I bawled my eyes out. Janet Duran and Tia Etcher. How cool. They knew how God had gifted them. Maybe not. Maybe didn't know. But you utilized your time and your, your encouragement and your love and your and to edify and build up the church. And my mom happened to be a recipient of it. Someone who was burned badly by the church and didn't want to go through that door, didn't want to expose herself to the vulnerability of potentially getting hurt again. They used their gifts for the will of God and to his glory to invite a hurt Christian back into the fold. I say all that for this reason. There are people that are at home right now. There are people in the pews right now that have been burned, hurt. You're confused. You don't know what's going on. And then there are others in this room that are sitting on your hands and wasting time, not giving your time for the glory of God and to the will of God to build his church and to edify his church with the gifts he's given you. And guess what? That person that's confused and hurt may need your gift. And you've been wasting time. I wish somehow I could go back in time and get Janet and Tia to call my mom years before. With the time you have left, don't do it for yourself. Do it for the will of God because it's to his glory and dominion forever and ever. Let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you that you don't just tell us to live a life for you, but you tell us how. What a gift. And God, I pray that there are that the individuals listening to this, God, that you would encourage them that even if it's a conviction, if it's uh, whatever that is, Father, that you would encourage them that they can be used by you by changing the way they think. That it would be you who they identify themselves with and that it would be for the edification of the church and for your glory that they live. Only you could do that. You're the one that changes the hearts of man. I could say all this stuff up here, but it doesn't matter if you're not involved. And so, Father, I pray that you would be in them and work through them. And we love you and we thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.